from Korea to Germany. From Alaska to Puerto Rico. All over the world, the United States Army is on the alert to defend our country, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture, an official television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now, to show you part of the big picture, here is Captain Carl Zimmerman. In the past, we have seen and heard reports of our fighting army in action. Men and weapons using firepower to defeat the enemy. But there is another very important phase of warfare. It has as its target, not the body, but the mind of the enemy. Its mission is to influence the thoughts of the enemy soldier and thereby weaken him. And at the same time, it brings to the no man's land of communism, the voice of the United Nations Command and the voice of truth. This part of the big picture is psychological warfare. It is words and ideas and carries on where the weapons have left off. Somewhere beyond these mountains is the enemy. His strength has been sapped by steady aerial strikes. and heavy artillery barrages. But he is still a long way from being defeated. He still has his will to fight. How can we weaken that will? How can we defeat him? By physical force? Yes, that's the most effective way. But there's another force applied in combat that we generally don't think of as a weapon of war. That weapon is words. Yes, in a situation like this, words are weapons. Now that the enemy has had a strong dose of our military power, the impact of words may provide the final persuasion. Words that go something like this. Soldiers of North Korea, you are surrounded. Your comrades are dying. You will die next. There is just one hope. Leave your positions tonight. This is psychological warfare, or at least it's one phase. As a weapon of war, psychological warfare is no novelty. It is as old as war itself. But the use of this force as an integral part of combat has now taken on new forms. And it works in many different ways. The printed word, and the spoken word. The Army's role in this kind of warfare is best described by Brigadier General Robert A. McClure, the Army's Chief of Psychological Warfare. Modern war has become a struggle for men's minds as well as for their bodies. Today we face an enemy who spends enormous sums of money and manpower all over the globe in an attempt to subvert the thinking of the people of the free world, to confuse, to divide, and ultimately to subjugate. This effort goes on day in and day out and it crackles about the heads of a world audience of untold millions. It is an ideological war, and in its own way, it is more of a total global war than any we have ever known. The enemy carries out this determined campaign of propaganda, subversion, and infiltration, not only during the Cold War, but also during the present hot war eruption in Korea. We, as well as the enemy, carry this ideological struggle right into the front lines in Korea. The North Korean government and the Chinese communists tell their own people that the United Nations Command carries out bacteriological warfare. They are told the United States is the aggressor in Korea. They are told that the communists are the champions of peace. A constant stream, a distortion of facts, misinterpretation of events, and outright lies pours from the propaganda machinery of the worldwide communist conspiracy. It is important to note that the number one target of this campaign of hate, vilification, and dissension is the United States. There is nothing that we do or say that is not immediately twisted, distorted, or misinterpreted to suit the ends of communist propaganda. Needless to say, we're not allowing the communists to foist this incredible fraud upon the world. 
It is up to us as a nation to checkmate this violent propaganda which is cleverly calculated to destroy us. Within the military, as in Korea today, this effort becomes an integral part of military operations. Regardless of what the communist propagandists tell our own people in North Korea and the North Korean and Chinese communist armies, we see to it that they know the truth. Significantly enough, a truth that they would never know if they did not get it through our own efforts. By news sheets, leaflets, radio, and loudspeakers, the true facts of communist aggression, duplicity, and totalitarian methods are kept before these people. Their leaders are uncomfortably aware of the fact that the truth does get out, and it is the truth that they fear. The bare, unvarnished truth does significant damage to the North Korean and Chinese communist armies. It causes dissension among their troops. It causes defection, desertion, and surrender. To us, psychological warfare is another support weapon in the arsenal of the military services. When it is properly used, in cooperation with the other elements of military power, it contributes to more economical attainment of a military objective. In other words, it reduces the amount of manpower and material expenditure necessary to do a given job. On June 25, 1950, within 48 hours of the outbreak of fighting in Korea, the United Nations began waging its psychological battle in support of our military objectives. First operations paralleled the early techniques of World War II. A specially equipped C-47 prepares for a psychological warfare mission into enemy-held territory. The plane is aptly named, for it carries an interpreter who will broadcast to the Reds as the voice of the United Nations. A truck is backed up to the storage compartment of the C-47, and cartons containing surrender leaflets are loaded into the plane for eventual release over enemy territory. At the same time, this loudspeaker will send the interpreter's voice reverberating through the hills to urge the Reds to surrender. With all the leaflets aboard, the plane takes off. It is one of several planes being used in Korea for this purpose. As the plane nears the drop zone, the cartons of leaflets are unwrapped so that they'll be ready for dropping when the plane reaches its target. Proper and humane treatment for any of the Chinese or North Koreans who throw in their lot with the United Nations forces is promised in these safe conduct passes. A similar method was used in the early stages of the Korean campaign when our propaganda was of a defensive nature and was designed to uplift the badly sagging morale of the South Koreans. In addition, an interpreter now delivers the same invitation and assurance over a loudspeaker. With this dual bombardment by leaflet and voice, the enemy receives the full effect of our psychological warfare. From the time our military effort shifted from offensive to defensive, psychological warfare has stayed abreast of the United Nations offensive action. Result, desertion, dissension, lowered morale, and surrender. Our propaganda was beginning to pay off. Meanwhile, back in Washington on January 15, 1951, psychological warfare was established as a special staff agency. This move had far-reaching results. In civilian colleges and universities, long-range recruiting and educational programs were instituted. Laboratory experiments and research led to new and better psychological warfare. Reserve units were recalled and several new units activated and at Fort Riley, Kansas, a psychological warfare training school was established. 
Here, recruits with specialized backgrounds were taught the nature, methods, and techniques of propaganda and its dissemination. At the same time, plans were launched for the permanent training center, now located at Fort Bragg. Meanwhile, like the fighting in Korea, psychological warfare operations went into high gear. At general headquarters in Tokyo, staff planning and supervision are handled by the psychological warfare section, while the operating unit in Tokyo is the first radio broadcasting and leaflet group. This group conducts strategic propaganda and supports the tactical operation in Korea. The effect of our psychological warfare in combat is described by Colonel Earl H. Chapman of Rivera, California. Communist propagandists continuously accuse us of indiscriminate bombings in North Korea. They conveniently ignore the warnings which psychological warfare gives to those people in and near military, uh, communist military installations. But the people of North Korea have come to learn the truth. Through warnings by radio and leaflets, these people know hours ahead of bombings and know when to evacuate. They have come to have a respect for that sense of decency which is found among the free-thinking people of the world and which is not found under the communist regime. Telling the truth is the only way in which to influence people who have become so unfortunate as to come under the domination of the communist regime. Currently broadcasting in Japan and Korea are 32 radio stations. For about four hours every evening, the stations deliver propaganda that thrusts at the communists in North Korea with facts. Radio presents these facts in any number of ways. Perhaps its most rewarding form of expression is news. For news is ready-made propaganda, and to an enemy denied access to outside information, it's as welcome as food and water. Radio's principal advantage is that it can reach remote areas and reach them quickly so that one program can be repeated and thereby reach a larger audience, it is often recorded on discs or on tape. The same show can be rebroadcast at convenient times in different areas and it may be relayed by fixed or mobile transmitters in the field. In addition to news, Radio employs other techniques to attract the maximum audience. For example, messages from prisoners of war are broadcast, assuring their families that they are safe and well cared for. These awaited messages induce the enemy civilian to turn his set on, and to make sure he'll keep it on, prisoner of war messages are spotted at different times during the week. Often, a radio program takes the form of a drama, such as we see now. Dramatization is close to the Oriental mind. For ever since his earliest schooling, the average Far Easterner has been taught by having things acted out for him. Carefully planned and rehearsed, these dramatic offerings play heavily upon the emotions. There is no strict evaluation of radio's achievement, but with a constant repetition of the free world's point of view, it is certain to have a cumulative effect upon the enemy nerve. This mobile radio broadcasting van in Seoul is one of many similar units set up across South Korea which help to carry the message of truth behind enemy lines. They perform in numerous ways as relay stations for larger networks, as a stopgap to fill a temporary void, or to lend direct support to the tactical operation. Captain Fred Laffey of Lawrence, Massachusetts, is in charge of these broadcasts, which reach millions of listeners in Korea and China. Every day are commentaries, interviews, dramatic shows, special features, and most important of all, our news broadcast, being to the people behind the Iron Curtain our most potent psi war weapon, truth. Even communist officers listen to these programs because they know that that's their only source of accurate, factual, unbiased information. At the radio broadcasting and leaflet group Central Printing Plant near Tokyo, 
are produced all strategic and many of the stock tactical leaflets. Every leaflet has a central idea or issue, which is exploited by any number of themes. Leaflets stress such points as the United Nations stand against aggression, the historic friendship between the United States and the people of China and Korea, the unfulfilled promises of communist leaders, and the horror of death away from home and family. Leaflets also stress the humane treatment of prisoners of war. And finally, the methods of surrender. In the selection of a theme, many factors must be considered. Does it capture the interest of the audience? Does it hold that interest? Above all, does it establish confidence in what we're saying? A theme has been selected. The theme is needless death. First, an artist prepares a dramatic piece of art, and the theme comes to life with a grief-stricken mother visualizing the pointless death of her soldier son. Two versions are prepared one for the Koreans and one for the Chinese. By using overlays, special care can be given to the varying details of the soldier's gun and uniform. Even a small inaccuracy may create a wave of ridicule among the enemy and destroy the effect of months of previous propaganda. The text that goes with the picture is first written in English. With the help of an interpreter, it is then translated into both Korean and Chinese. Short, punchy words that make their point quickly and fan the soldier's feeling of despair. He has fed the thought that he will soon join the swelling victims of needless death. The final draft is then reviewed. In many red units, offenders found reading UN literature have been shot by the firing squad while their comrades were forced to look on. Finally, the leaflet is approved for production. One index of the leaflet's effectiveness is the elaborate effort the enemy spends in guarding against it. As a weapon of psychological warfare, the leaflet is invaluable. Chinese and Korean soldiers are especially impressed by realistic drawings and photographs. Moreover, the leaflet is far more permanent than the spoken word, for it can be read and re-read. After copy and artwork are okayed, they are photographed and processed. Plates are then mounted on the presses. Although they are warned by their leaders that UN leaflets are impregnated with germs and will rot their hands or make them blind, many prisoners of war have been found to carry them secretly. And the size of the leaflet is such that it can be easily concealed. Leaflets are then packed in rolls so that the maximum number can be carried in one load. They are then placed into bombs. Normally, each bomb accommodates about 22,500 leaflets of lightweight paper. Bombs are systematically loaded into trucks and transported to the airfield. This B-29 is about to range deep into enemy territory. It is a fighting craft equipped to take care of itself against enemy attack.
We can only estimate roughly how many airmail copies of needless death will reach the individual enemy. Nevertheless, overall we do know that leaflets will scatter the seeds of dissension, unrest, and possibly surrender. In Korea, tactical propaganda is handled by the psychological warfare section of 8th Army. A large share of intelligence is gained by interrogating prisoners of war, done by G2 teams. Special psychological warfare interrogation teams conduct closer examinations of the prisoners and poll them. Often they speak freely and offer important facts about the conditions they left behind them in their own front lines. This information, when evaluated and interpreted, indicates how effective our past propaganda effort has been. It also supplies the basis for further speaker broadcast and leaflet themes. Since themes are often individually tailored to meet an existing frontline situation, the l and company must meet that situation before it changes. So that our propaganda can take advantage of the psychology of the hour, tactical leaflets are run off on the company's own presses, which can operate in buildings or in vans. Leaflets are disseminated in two ways. First, by air, as we have seen, and second, by artillery shells. Specifically adapted, these 105 millimeter shells can pinpoint selected targets and reach troops in the most localized areas. Leaflet shells can also strike at combat zones in which aircraft would be impractical. In addition, these message-filled missiles are able to penetrate densely wooded areas. Leaflets are printed a color in vivid contrast to the terrain they are aimed at. They are best fired at twilight, since it is still light enough for the enemy to see where they land, yet dark enough to cover him when he gathers up the literature, which is going to him, Air Express. The loudspeaker platoon of the loudspeaker and leaflet company operates directly with the frontline unit. These loudspeakers are used to get across timely messages to the enemy in close proximity. Furthermore, illiteracy is prevalent among the Chinese and North Koreans, so the spoken message makes our meaning thoroughly clear. The hazards met by the men operating these loudspeaker units is described by Sergeant Leon Nelson of Poland Springs, Maine. I do remember one incident that pretty well typifies our silent operation on the front lines. I think it was last winter that uh, our Cywar team, our loudspeaker team, had just set up its loudspeaker and microphone and sound equipment on a ridge overlooking a company of Chinese communists, which were completely surrounded by United Nations Command forces. Well, once the surrender appeal was underway, the broadcast was in progress, uh, scores of uh, artillery rounds started pouring in and uh, mortar. The uh, Chinese communists obviously were zeroing in, and uh, needless to say, once the broadcast was completed, uh, our Cywar team didn't hang around for long. And uh, incidentally, neither did the company of Chinese communists. Now, from what I've told you, you may think that our loudspeaker men work under rather adverse conditions. They do. But as any Cy warrior will tell you, these are the risks that the frontline infantry soldier takes every day. When more mobility is desired, loudspeakers are mounted on tanks. The physical force of the tank, coupled with the psychological force of the loudspeaker, is an ideal example of psychological warfare's most effective performance. A similar combination is the airborne loudspeaker. Mounted in a tactical aircraft, it can reach enemy territory, inaccessible by ground loudspeakers and it can cover both civilian control and guerrilla areas. Because of their nostalgia value, the voices of Korean and Chinese women are often used. Some enemy soldiers feel that if a woman can fly over their positions, the communists must be losing the war. In the time that lies ahead, still newer methods of propaganda are growing out of research and experimentation. But the job of carrying the truth to the people goes on all the time. By loudspeaker in the streets and by radio in the ruins of bombed homes, a bewildered people listen, learn, hoping for something better.
the voice of the United Nations carries on where bullets and shell fire cease, bringing hope to many for the first time. For psychological warfare and its media of expression are dynamic, always learning sure ways of breaking the spirit of the enemy. The value of psychological warfare today is described in Tokyo by Colonel J. Woodall Green. Psychological warfare has been well established as a modern military weapon. Its usefulness in cooperation with other military weapons has been thoroughly proven in Korea. The target of psychological warfare is against the enemy's mind, while the other weapons, their target is the enemy's body. Facts are the ammunition used by Cywar, and the enemy's job is to keep unpleasant facts from their people. Therefore, our job is to break this barrier of the communists and to get the truth and the facts to the communist people. In the front line, Cywar works against the enemy's morale to make him suspicious of his officers and to make and to cause him to worry about the conditions back home and thus to lower his fighting efficiency and to make him think of surrendering or deserting. These are the Psy War soldiers. They alone do not win victories in combat, but they have a potent weapon which they use to the utmost to support the infantrymen and the tanker in inflicting decisive defeat upon the enemy. Yes, in modern warfare, our military leaders are finding that words and ideas are highly effective weapons. Next week, our cameras will take us to Korea for interesting stories and anecdotes that seldom reach the public eye. This is Captain Carl Zimmerman inviting you to be with us then. The Big Picture is a weekly television report to the nation on the activities of the Army at home and overseas. Produced by the Signal Corps Pictorial Center. Presented by the U.S. Army in cooperation with this station. You can be an important part of the big picture. You can proudly serve with the best equipped, the best trained, the best fighting team in the world today, the United States Army.